I'm on. It's 6 p.m. and I'm calling the June 13, 2022 Transportation Advisory Meeting Board Meeting to order. I second. Sandra Stewart. Present. Liz Osborne. Present. Courtney Michelle. Present. David McInerney. Present. Steve Lehner. Present. Diane Christ. I second the motion. Okay, it's been, is there any discussion? It's been moved and seconded. Okay, all those in favor um, may um, designate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Yes, thank you. Bill, do we have any communication from you? Um, actually, we have some communication from um, Jim Angstead, so I'd ask him to come down and chat a little bit about, uh, I think it was the budget. <laughs> He's giving me that look, so. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> Monday meeting. Good evening, uh, Jim Angstead, Director of Engineering Services. Um, Phil is not correct. We're not going to talk about the budget. We just want to give an overview of a public meeting we had uh, last Monday, a week ago. Um, this was a uh, public engagement session to uh, advise uh, City of Longmont residents of four projects that are currently underway, uh, focusing on the area west of Main Street, south of 9th, and north of 2nd. Uh, the projects in, included the Boston Avenue Bridge, uh, which is currently in design and will be uh, going out to bid uh, later this month, hopefully, and then with construction starting in the fall. The other project was the uh, uh, Price Park uh, water tank. Uh, we're replacing the reservoirs. Um, they are, that is actually uh, out, to, out for construction. You're going to see more work uh, after Labor Day. Uh, we're currently in a, in a procurement phase. Um, of getting uh, materials together, and then we will uh, start that work. Um, and then uh, one other project was the Third Avenue improvements, which included some water line work, uh, some drainage work, and then we're, we're currently working on uh, some, some adjustments, some safety improvements, traffic mitigation on Third, which will be instituted uh, probably in about a year's time next year as we go and repave um, the uh, Third Avenue. And what was the fourth one? Oh, Coffin, <laughs> right behind me. Thank you. That's Alden Jenkins. Uh, Coffin Avenue, uh, the busway project, uh, that is currently at about 60% uh, design. Yeah, there we go. Uh, with construction work uh, more than likely starting maybe tail end of 2023 or early 2024. So if you have any questions, uh, happy to answer them um, or about any other transportation issues you may want to hear in the city. Yeah, just real quickly, this was, I'm sorry, a public participation, like a listening session? Um, well, we, we ran it a little bit differently. We, we had a, a short presentation in the beginning uh, for about 15, 20 minutes. Then we took questions. Then we opened it up uh, and had like four stations for those projects. And we asked residents to talk one-on-one -on -one with, um, with our project managers. And then for the uh, Third Avenue improvements, because it's kind of, there's a lot going on there. We had a role plot. And we ask people to, to make any notes of any issues they saw. Um, and then we'll, we'll take a look at them and see what we can do. Can I ask what the turnout was? Um, we had about, uh, I want to say about 40 residents. Any other questions? Okay. 
questions? You said it was fair to ask any other question, so I'm going to ask one that's been on my mind for a couple weeks. I sit on the front row, my house is next to some new buildings going in, new apartments, and it occurs to me that the city is building a lot of apartments. The city is also wanting to increase the number of electric cars. What is being done to make sure that people who live in apartment complexes have easy access to power stations for their cars? Oh, yeah. You can take it, Phil. Is that okay? Yeah, <laughs> Phil will answer that one. <laughs> Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the city. Um, we're working with our Longmont Power and Communication Group to make sure that as those uh, multifamily units do come online, that there will be at some point. It's not going to be these ones that you see being built, but we're trying to work with um, folks. Uh, there's, there's a few grant opportunities that are out there as well, but uh, the Longmont Power and Communications is very much aware of the need for putting in those uh, charging stations at each one of these multifamily units. It's just a matter of how do we incorporate that into the design piece? And they're trying to get them into the existing as well, but it's it's um, obviously a pretty big undertaking, and you have to have that demand as well at the, and and that's obviously growing. So we're 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 seeing that. Well, this, the code changes will be at the um, at the city level. City so level. we're talking about how we can incorporate those changes into the code to actually push that issue as these developments come online. So that's what LP. LPC, the Longmont Power and Communications Group, is doing as well as uh, with our building officials and the planning folks to, to make sure those start to get incorpororated into the code. So sure. one of the other efforts the city's also working on is where we're currently looking at grant dollars uh, um, and working with NRail uh, to do some studies to see where we want to put stations in and around the city. So, and and then as Phil indicated, there is a lot of grant dollars out there available, uh, or seem to be. So we are trying to pursue what we can in, in that area, and that's across the board for almost every all of our infrastructure. I will just mention that there's one more item from staff, but we'd like to save it for the end. Thank you. Yes, I'll introduce this, if you don't mind. Great, thank you very much. Again, Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the city. Tonight we have a number of folks from uh, Boulder County, CDOT, and RTD to help present on this topic because they're all, we're all working together. We're actually working with this group as well, so we we know these folks pretty, pretty well, and so it's good to see them in Longmont and uh, have an in-person meeting, I'm sure. Um, they would have preferred not to drive up, but <laughs> we, we all appreciate that they're here and some of them actually live in Longmont. So with that, I will turn it over to Stacy Proctor from Boulder County Trans Transportation, or maybe we'll start with yeah, Adna Adnana instead. Um, so Adnana Mertek from CDOT will lead off the discussion and kind of give you some of that background. And, and um, well, with that, I'll let, let you go ahead, Adana. Thanks. Sounds great. Thank you, Phil. Well, good evening, everybody. First of all, I want to thank you for um, having us here tonight. Uh, my name is Adnana Murtic. I'm with CDOT. I'm the project manager for uh, Colorado 119 uh, Safety and uh, Mobility Project. And as Phil already mentioned, uh, we have all around here, Stacy Proctor and Ali Emancipahi with RTD, and Stephen Humphrey with Muller Engineering, who's actually representing um, both projects, really, <laughs> because we have the same consultant on both. And again, um, just uh, wanted to give you uh, a quick uh, overview of uh, what we have been uh, doing in a, uh, in a, a few months. And uh, we are reaching, at this point, we are reaching preliminary design uh, milestone in, yeah, we have scheduled a public meeting that is happening on the 27th. And uh, this tonight, as I said, is a, is a preview for, uh, for you to um, share with you what we're working on and, and have your feedback and your uh, input. And we will uh, provide that information 
uh, at the end of the meeting how everybody uh, interested uh, in registering. So again, uh, when it comes to uh, safety uh, challenges on, on this corridor, so basically um, numbers are showing really uh, that, that the highest crash corridor for motorists and the second highest uh, for bicyclists in the Boulder County. And the numbers are really concerning. And, and as you can uh, see, in a period of five years, there's been over 900 crashes and uh, four of them were fatalities. So uh, our goal here, um, by working on, on these two projects is definitely to, as you uh, try to, to improve that safety and, and uh, uh, percentages on the right are uh, representing what we're expecting to see uh, once when we implement all of these uh, improvements in this, in this corridor. So again, for the mobility challenges, uh, corridor, um, Lacks, uh, uh, lacks safe and uh, direct ways uh, uh, to bicycle connections between Boulder and Longmont. And in, uh, for this, this the bikeway, uh, commuter, uh, commuter bikeway project is definitely um, a very important component to uh, overcome those challenges. And then uh, BRT uh, provided by uh, RTD is the service who's going to address that congestion and uh, enable buses to uh, have better travel times and be more reliable. And again, that uh, the traffic and increase of traffic and constant congestion is definitely uh, what we want to um, achieve here to uh, by improving um, each inter signalized intersection and, and provide all modes of uh, mobility through the corridor. This slide here. Um, I like to call it a snapshot of everything that we're doing because it's, it really represents um, the scope for both projects and uh, what we're looking and what we're going to talking about tonight are basically the, uh, the part of diagonal from Boulder to Longmont, a uh, southern limit of the project being at the uh, Foothills Parkway, northern uh, limit would be at uh, Hover. And again, we have, when it comes to roadway, um, intersection improvements, and then uh, BRT service, of course, in those elements in the bikeway uh, project right in the middle of, um, of that um, corridor. Next one talking about BRT elements. Yeah, go back. Yeah, we got through it. And, uh, <laughs> plus rapid transit. Plus rapid transit. <laughs> Good timing. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go back to the. Oh, my name is Ali Mansopahi with RTD. I'm the project manager for RTD for this project. Um, going back to this map that Adnana showed, which, as she said, the snapshot of the whole picture, um, we said it's safety mobility improvements project plus the bikeway, commuter bikeway project. So then, to make you even more confused, the RTD part is really two projects within one. One is what is in diagonal with all the improvements that you see, uh, being the parking rides at Niwad and 63rd, plus a pair of BRT stops at uh, State Highway 52 or Mineral, IBM Drive, I guess is the other name for it. But then, the other part of the project, which is a parallel effort that RTD is going to undertake along with this project is to make those improvements in Longmont and Boulder. See the red bus logos are BRT grade stops, plus um, the parking ride, that P that you see, up by Highway 66, which is going to be a new parking ride that I'm working with my friend over there, Phil, to, um, to implement. So to this other slide. Um, and just to remind Ali, um, we're also going to build First and Main with them as well. <laughs> so our, our major hub downtown. Um, this project has been in the works as part of the improvements um, identified by the Northwest Area Mobility Study, or NAMS, back in 2014, followed by the uh, planning and environmental linkage study uh, that was finalized in September of 2019. And here is where we are with the selected alternatives, having the BRT service 
uh, from downtown Boulder to northern Longmont um, along the way where you see the stops and the diagonal, the parking rides, everything's listed here. And the frequencies that you see, 15 minutes for, there, there are two um, uh, renditions of the BRT, the orange route, the blue route, um, and the numbers that you see are straight out of that planning and environmental linkage, or PEL. Those numbers will be revisited because we're in the post-pandemic world and uh, we're just going to uh, start somewhere, but those are the numbers from the PEL. Uh, obviously, BRT service is more reliable, much faster than uh, the regular Bolt route that we have right now. It connects the cities of Boulder and Longmont. Um, the improvements that Adnana alluded to, Q bypass lanes, transit signal priority, um, and a whole bunch of intersection improvements will be implemented as part of this project. And uh, we do believe that this BRT project will shorten the transit trips by about 50% um, as opposed to what you have out there, which is Bolt. With that, is it I, think I think I'm up oh, next. You're up. Sorry. Awesome. No worries. Just a quick reminder, I'm Stephen Humphrey with Muller. We're working on the design of the 119 safety mobility project, and I get to talk to you a little bit about some of the design details here today, which is the fun part for me, at least. Um, anyway, we, ca we don't have time to get into all the intersections and all the improvements tonight, not in the time frame we've got. We tried to highlight a few of the key intersections that we think would be higher on the list for the city of Longmont. Um, so what we're going to go over tonight is the 52 intersection and then moving north, the Niwot Road intersection, and we're going to finish out at the airport road intersection and we'll walk through um, some design details and some information for you. So we'll start here with 52 first. As you can kind of see from this graphic, it's one of the more significant sets of improvements in the corridor. Um, what we have today, one of the bigger challenges is the long queues in the corridor and there's no longer queue than at 52 currently. And so those queues are, are longer than you might expect if you're a driver on a typical sort of highway, freeway, whatever you might call it. And so a lot of the crashes you might see in the corridor are drivers not expecting to have to slam their brakes from, you know, 65, 75 miles an hour um, down to a stop because of those queues. And so through a pretty extensive traffic analysis, we came up with this alternative you see up here to realign um, southbound away from northbound and uh, kind of reconfigure into two different intersections instead of one. And I don't have like a pointer, so I apologize. Maybe I do on here, I don't know. But you can kind of see in the background of this graphic that the existing intersection, perfect, is just a little bit um, to the north, east on the diagonal. It's always fun directions on the diagonal. A little bit to the northeast and is currently uh, an intersection that's together, northbound and southbound are together. So we're gonna be moving it a little bit further to the south and separating those two intersections. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we're going to be um, constructing the two BRT stations that you see there uh, and also, yep, right there, perfect. Um, and then we're also going to be looking at some traffic signal and timing improvements that'll help with the operations too. It's not just about separating them out, it's about how we use those traffic signals to improve connections through here. And then of course, I'd be remiss without mentioning the bikeway underpass that's going to get constructed there as well. That's of course part of the broader improvements. Um, so that's just a quick snapshot of 52 and I'll move on to Niwot Road here. And uh, for those that joined us earlier this morning, I think I said there's a lot going on at 63rd Street. There's also a lot going on at Niwot Road, and I kind of didn't get a chance to get into those details. But um, at this location, you'll see there's one of the two proposed parking lots or park and ride locations and the two BRT stations. Um, and then we'll talk through at all five intersections. I didn't go over this at 52, but at all five intersections, you'll see we have these Q bypass lanes in the middle and they're kind of that, actually it looks dark red on this screen here to me. They're those dark red lanes and, and what that serves uh, to do is if you're headed on northbound um, and you're in that queue, you're sitting there at peak hour during the day at five o'clock and you're waiting in traffic, that bus is gonna have a dedicated lane where it can move around the traffic, move up to the intersection and then get that sort of first priority over to the station 
at which point they'll be able to load with passengers and have an acceleration lane to move back into the general traffic um, on the other side of the intersection. Of course. Um, is this just going to be We're still working through those details. It's absolutely going to be a lot more than a painted line at those stations. <laughs> There's going to be, yeah, and I don't know that we've finalized that exact striping um, and spacing, but it's certainly going to be more than your your typical 12 foot lane next to a 12 foot lane with a six foot stripe. Um, I think there's a bit of a more of a width there and different striping as well. I'll just say, I just asked the question whether there'll be more than just painted lines dividing the BRT lane from the rest of regular traffic. And you will see, again, um, there will be, the short answer is there will be, and we can refine as we get to final design exactly what those details are. This is a good example where you can see here that we do still have those cars that will need to turn left. And in some mm -hmm. scenarios up and down the corridor, there's going to be an interface between that Q bypass lane and the left turn lane. So there's a lot going on there that we kind of have to navigate the 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 general purpose lanes, safety for the bus and the bypass lane, and then safety and sort of, I don't know, almost like a common sense way and signage to help people understand how to get in that left turn lane. Because it's not, the first day they drive it, it's not going to be um, it, it's super intuitive, right? You don't see that a whole lot, the buses in a bus bypass lane on the, on the median side of a highway. So follow-up question would be, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a decrease in the speed limit. Because as you know, when you leave the Niwot intersection, it goes up fairly quickly, and most folks are already hitting 70 before they even hit the 65. And we've had many conversations about that. I'm sure you're well-versed in how the speed limit um, sort of setting happens within the state of Colorado. It's not always favorable if you pursue a, a higher, or excuse me, a lower speed limit. I do know that we've talked with the traffic group that there's some, some variability and some changes in that policy in recent years. And so I think that's another conversation we need to have as the design is fleshed out, some of those conversations about what the posted speed limit will be. Well, I would just think, sorry to ask these questions as a follow-up. I would just think with the BRT and having, we'll call it rapid transit, with, we'll call it mixed vehicles, it should not be classified as like a full highway at 65, 70 miles an hour. It just shouldn't be. No, it's a good comment and something we need to take into consideration. But we haven't had that opportunity to kind of nail down exactly what those speed limits are. We know what they are today, which you're exactly right, 55 going to 65. And I think as we, we finish up the design and look at these improvements, that can be evaluated. Thank you. All right. Um, so also here at uh, NIWAT, we are going to see, and as part of actually a, a, a separate but still incredibly connected project, there'll be um, transit signal priority um, incorporated into this uh, intersection and all the other intersections. And then we're also going to be doing a series of safety and operational improvements that don't sound big but do pay off, and that's upgrading signage and roadway striping and lighting at these intersections and even um, some new signal poles. So there's there's some of the smaller things that, that maybe don't get noticed at the end of the job that will hopefully have um, some, some good impact in terms of safety and operational benefits for the corridor. And then the last one we've got to look at tonight is the airport road intersection. So here we're proposing a, a change in, in how access works at, at airport in 119. Um, and so what we're looking at as far as that adjustment would be that between northbound 119 and southbound 119, which you see here on the page, currently that's, that's two-way operations. In the future, we'd be proposing that to be a uh, single northbound, two sets of lanes. Um, and the, that'll result in a couple different changes for airport road that would turn into a right turn only scenario at 119 and then also for the opposite intersection there at Ogallala would be a right turn only as well. Yep, thank you, no, that's perfect. Um, and so 
the reason or like the, the thought process there is to help with bo- both the overall operations of the corridor, but also I know there's quite a few safety concerns at this area and there's a, a very unique interface with the bikeway in this area. So um, the goal would be to reduce the number of conflict points to plan out for that future of I always get this wrong. Is it the orange line or the blue line that, that goes up Airport Road? But orange, orange, orange line. Thank you. Um, but basically, the goal here is to improve safety and operations at the Airport Road intersection. Um, and again, very similar operational safety improvements as far as the signing, striping, and everything else that we talked about at NIWAT. And then the other piece that I haven't talked about at the other two that are critical at all of these intersections, which is. Um, since we are creating such a, a multimodal corridor, connections to and from. So how do I walk to this area? How do I bike to this area? There are a lot of connections um, that need to be thought out both today and the current condition that's going to get built and also future master plan conditions, whether it's first and final mile type improvements or other improvements as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, at the airport road, so the orange line is going to be turning left when it's going north on 119. That's correct? That's correct. Right. Okay. Yep. All right. And if there aren't any other questions. Wait, they're they're oh. off. They're oh, off. I'm so sorry. No, yeah. No, no, <laughs> um, I see that the Longmont Boulder Trail has no connection here to cross over 119. Is that not going to be considered a trail anymore? There's no pedestrian connection on, I guess that's the east side of 119. <coughs> I can just do that. Oh, God, so um. Can I ask a, just a quick question on the on the bike capacity for number one the buses? How many are they going to be able to hold, and will there be any storage or anything at some of these these um, BRT stations? Seeing that the buses may not be able to handle. Mm-hmm. 
Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, has it been considered to make pedestrian and bike lane in the same, down the middle, to have a, a pedestrian side along with two bike lanes? We have been, um, have As, as we already mentioned, uh, both projects are, are reaching a really important milestone when it comes to design. We're getting to 30% uh, um, next month uh, both for both projects and uh, expecting to have a final design and advertise uh, next summer uh, 2023. And uh, definitely uh, when we get closer to, to that uh, milestone final design, uh, we will know more about uh, construction schedule and construction impact, and then uh, we're expecting to have a um, uh, better, uh, better uh, idea of what that might uh, look like. And uh, again, I mentioned a public meeting that's happening on the 27th, and um, that's the first one, uh, team effort again, just, just uh, informing public of, uh, about both projects. And in the meantime, we're uh, working with uh, community um, 
advisory uh, committee and equity advisory committee and both have been uh, really great with, uh, with their time and their input and help on both of these, both of these projects. And uh, next one, uh, we're expecting, as I said, uh, next summer. And then um, if you um, are interested, of course, and we would love to have you there, uh, public meeting link is included here, and uh, you can register through this link. It's, uh, again, on the 27th. And um, there, is, there is different ways to uh, to engage in the project and provide your input, provide feedback, and ask us questions, please. I mean, there's there's emails here uh, to uh, reach us, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, answer any uh, questions and take your fee feedback into consideration. So once again, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, you're fine. Um, just one last question in regards to the data collection on uh, ridership. So maybe it's an RTD question. Is there any sort of certainty in terms of, and the numbers might be hard, but do you know if it's more of a flow from Longmont to Boulder that's most important, or is it from Boulder to Longmont? Yeah, not Longmont to Boulder, Boulder to Longmont. In other words, is, is it a you know equivalent number, or do you look at it as being heavier, you know, one way versus the other? It's. For, to give you a better num uh, answer, I should definitely jot it down and get back to you, but when we were doing the modeling, uh, transit modeling for this, it was predominantly in the morning, it would be Longmont to Boulder, and then in the afternoon, it would be northbound, if you will. But I can get you better, better numbers if okay. I look at the model. No, that would be helpful just to understand. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Any any other questions before we wrap up? Thank you. I do have some questions, although Mr. Um, Lehner asked some of them. Uh, when you talked about uh, safety and how many vehicle accidents and how many bicycle cra crashes. There, you mentioned two pedestrian crashes. Is that automobile pedestrian or automobile, or I'm sorry, pedestrian and bicycle? Do you know? No, uh, honestly, I, I don't know the details about that one. So I apologize for that, but it's definitely something that we can look into. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, let's see. I have a few, a few other, I notice on the bus rapid transit map. It doesn't really extend to the east side of Longmont in terms of bus service, but we're still going to have bus service out on the east side. Is that correct? The bus on the east? On the east side, uh, northeast side of Longmont. And perhaps you could tell me whether that's a 15-minute 15, 15 interview interval or a 30-minute interval. I can help out a little bit too, just to... Uh, um, Okay. Get back to that idea of partnership with uh, with these folks. Uh, we are working with RTD to expand our local bus services once BRT is up and running. So we are looking at lo those local bus services being expanded and um, a little bit more robust on the east side of town, especially when we're talking about the UC Health Center and those type of new facilities that aren't currently covered by fixed route. But they do also have a used to be called a colon ride, now it's called a flex ride, which covers the whole city, so that'll also provide some of that access, on-demand access, um, to our first and main station is really what we're planning for for that too, but it, it'll provide access across the city, but sorry. Oh, you're right, I, you said things I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, the, the, so um, this is what was envisioned from the PEL study, that planning and environmental linkage uh, which came up with the uh, two scenarios that you see here after years of, um, you know, going through that process. But um, al along the, what you see here, we also anticipate we're going to be looking into um, some micro transit alternatives like uh, the flex rides that you see um, in other areas that RTD serves. Um, I'm not saying it's for sure going to happen, but they're going to be looking at them. Uh, I'm not sure if Longmont currently has one, though, right? So there may be expansion to that. 
to help with that first and last mile issues well, like with any other service. Currently there's a, a route that goes down 21st and one that goes down Pace. Is that going to continue or is that going to be eliminated until all of this is active? They're planning on, uh, RTD is planning on changing some of those route configurations on the east okay. side to better serve the east and mm -hmm. provide more trips per day. Okay. But that's all contingent on resources and those kind of things. So okay. um, not, not definitely a given, but certainly something we've been working with the planning group, which Holly is not part of. He's more of the engineering group. Right. <laughs> so we've been working with the planning group on that to really bring up that fixed route system on the east side of town because of exactly what you mentioned is the original idea was to have maybe three branches in Longmont, an east side, a center, and a west side. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it didn't really make sense uh, to, to have that, those three level because we couldn't keep, we couldn't have the buses run as often as we do in this in this in this configuration. Mm -hmm. So, um, the supplement is to bring on the east side local bus service to bring people into into town and bring them to the first and main station. So people from the east side will have to get into the first and main station. And we had talked um, last time, uh, Mr. Greenwald, about uh, expanding bicycle opportunities down Weld County Road. Are people expected then to bicycle down to First and Main, or will there be a way to, to catch a bus to do that? You should be able to catch a bus or take a bicycle. So we're opening it up for mm -hmm. both, well, for all options. You can, you could, you know, we have a park and ride there, so you could park and ride, par park, your bi park your car or your bicycle mm -hmm. um, there. You could also, there's also a drop-off point if you take an Uber, Lyft, or if you have somebody drive you down, uh, you can be dropped off. There'll be a drop-off lane at First and Main as well. So then you'll have direct access to the St. Vrain Greenway, which is just to the south of there. So it'll have direct access from that point. So you'll have that good east-west bicycle connection and pedestrian connection, and then into downtown. So we're, we're trying to cover all the different options to try to get people yes. covering that first and last mile uh, to First and, first and Main specifically but then along those corridors that you saw as well. So up at 17th and Main, uh, not the same situation, but a similar situation where you have a very robust uh, bus station that RTD is gonna be providing. And then we'll have those connections that the city provides to those, to those new sp stops there, as well as at 66th and, uh, and Main Street. And you saw some along Hoover as well, so the, that, that's another corridor. And along Airport Road, that's more of that orange line that uh, Ollie was talking about. So. With all of those, we're trying to provide as much coverage as we possibly can with all the different modes we can. It seems to me with only um, eight positions available for bicycles on buses that you're either committing to a bus ride or a bicycle ride, but it's hard to do both um, during rush hour. Uh, am I correct in, in that statement? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's definitely been an issue even on flat iron flyers. Um, mm -hmm. They are, we're, we're striving to come up with better ways to transport bicycles and allow for more storage on board. Um, that said, I'm not sure, Brian, do you know any of any new ways that we're going to be doing things? I didn't think so, but... Um, um, Go ahead. Can, can chime in. Yeah, sure. So we're also working with uh, the city of Boulder has has decided to contract with B Cycle, continue that contract, and that's a bike share program that also includes electric bicycles. In fact, I think uh, most of their fleet is electric bicycles now. So we're working Louisville, Lafayette, Longmont, Superior, um, into Broomfield, in fact, and Westminster. We're working along the whole corridor just to try to bring on the same a same or a similar type operation within our cities. So you could technically pick up a B-cycle in Longmont, ride it to First and Main, leave it there, get on the bus, pick up a B-cycle in Boulder and, and finish your trip in Boulder. So you would never have to necessarily own a vehicle for that entire, whether it's a bicycle mm -hmm. or whatever, but uh, you wouldn't have to necessarily hoof your bike everywhere you wanted to. You could, you could almost, you know, kind of rent a bike or bike share. Mm -hmm. So. Those are the other options that we're looking into as kind of a longer term solution to what I think you're yeah, I think to. I think that's a great idea because uh, having that bicycle sometimes becomes a liability then you know, right. and, and you look at the distance and you think well and as discussed earlier yeah. uh, if it's an e-bike <laughs> you know 
Yeah. Uh, that can't be going up and down the bus that easily. So right, right, it's yeah, heavy. So I'm glad to hear about the idea of the B cycle implementation too. So. Okay, so I'm, I made my comments as we went along. Um, so if you're commuting from other cities, like say from Frederick or Mead, do you then have to drive into Longmont in order to access this system, or is there going to be some kind of um, suburban commuting by, via bus? So, so currently, RTD is doing a system optimization plan, okay. which they're going to be looking at the entire system within the district. Um, unfortunately, I don't know much about it, but uh, my colleagues do because they're very involved with that. That would be a better question for them to answer, and I would be more than happy to take your question and see what is happening in, in those areas. Oh, I'd appreciate that. And usually what we do is we give all that to Mr. Greenwald, and he disperses sure. it to us. <laughs> yeah. One other answer to that might be that all the areas I think you just mentioned are outside the regional transportation district boundary. They are, so yeah. they do not get taxed and they do not have service except through service. The bus will go through some of those areas, but they won't stop. So mm -hmm. they've been working with, and Southwest Weld County has been working with uh, VIA Mobility Services. Mm -hmm. And so VIA is starting to provide mm -hmm. those trips, those, those pretty critical trips from those, those smaller towns and, that you mentioned in Weld County to Longmont, to Boulder. And I think a majority of those trips have actually come to Longmont, as what I understand from VIA. So what we'd like to do is probably enhance that service and look at some other operators that uh, could provide that service. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, that those towns could look into annexing into RTD, RTD as well. Yeah. So those are a couple options. And, and, and um, Mr. Greenwald, you and I have talked about VIA before. Um, and, and I guess um, what I remember is in a prior meeting, we talked about a lot of pass-through traffic in Longmont in terms of on on the diagonal. And a lot of that comes from um, suburban towns that are not part of RTD and don't have bus service. So I'm just wondering how that was going to be handled. And then, okay, so I think it's the slide before um, the bus rapid transit, the safety and mobility and bikeway projects. There's on the, um, the green, uh, that is the bikeway underpass and trail. It has a line that says northern limit and southern limit. And so I was just wondering, and I think um, I understand that airport is one of the places that we can access it via bicycle. But do we have adequate trails throughout Longmont to access this portion of the um, bike route? Uh, I would say at this point in time, we don't have all the adequate pieces that we need, but we do have a great new underpass that was created a couple of years ago that's underneath the diagonal highway that connects both sides. What we are missing is that section that goes down to left hand, and that's being constructed with a new development that you'll probably see on Hover on the west side of Hover, south of Pike at this point in time. So they will be constructing that piece, that missing link piece up. And so with the different things that are coming online and the, and the different ways that we've put together some of these segments, we feel like we'll have uh, pretty good access, but we, it, it'll need improvement. So okay. we'll, we'll look at that. Okay. Just as a, as a bus rider, I'm a long time bus rider, it's sometimes really helpful to have a bicycle if you've missed the bus, I'm just saying. Okay, so uh, if we go down to uh, this in Niwot, or let's see what comes next, the Colorado 52 intersection. I noticed the, um, does the bus queue lane exist, or are you needing more land, or is the center land adequate to create that extra lane for buses? And do you have an idea of the cost of the project for this um, renegotiation of the traffic pattern? Do you want to take this? Or sure, sure, we could yeah. tandem it or tag team it. So, <laughs> yeah. tag the easy team. answer is the, the right of way or the land exists today. So there's just about a 12 or 16 foot expansion of the pavement that you would see out there today into the middle. Um, except here where we're reconstructing, obviously that'll all be reconstructed, but that's all right of way that um, is owned by CDOT today, um, with the exception of a a series of easements both on the IVM property and to the east that have been negotiated in the past um, for previous projects that are going to need to be revisited. But um, the right-of-way or those easements are 
uh, by far in a way negotiated or in place already. Um, so that, that part of it is the easy part. The cost estimate piece uh, is we have a number today and, and I'm not sure it'll be good tomorrow or a week from now, but uh, the number we have for 52, this full set of improvements you're seeing here was in the range of 25 to $30 million just for this one intersection alone. Um, but again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that number is good a week from now or a month from now. Okay, in today's dollars. Yes, ma'am. And so the um, the right to the land exists, and is it mostly in the center median, or is it inv invading the um, outer portions? The, so I guess, yeah, just in general terms, the northbound or the, the lanes you see at the bottom are sort of staying right where they were before, where northbound exists today. Okay. So the shift is actually where um, southbound, southbound is shifting to the west, okay. still within uh, right away. It's kind of hard to see faded back in the back, but just for, for purposes of orienting yourself, you can almost see the solar farms up in the corner there. And then you can mm -hmm. see sort of the faint right away line that's just outside the solar farm there. You can see we're, we're staying within that everywhere through that area there, but it is a shift. Uh, northbound will be staying largely on the same or similar alignment of the pavement today, and then southbound will be moving out to the east, which actually, you know, I'm getting way into the weeds, but from a construction standpoint, it'll be pretty advantageous to be able to, to construct that those lanes offline, be able to safely shift people over, and then build the new lanes northbound. Um, it's very advantageous from a safety perspective, perspective during construction, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it makes sense to move more towards the solar and not be closer to where the train comes through. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. Now, um, the bikeway underpass there, I think, is longer than the 10 by 14 that you had discussed for the other underpasses. Well, yeah, and I guess I can clarify that, but the 10 by 14 is the opening of the box culvert. Each one okay. of these is somewhere between, like, as far as length of the intersection, maybe 200 feet and 250 feet. This one may be even a little bit longer than that, and that's just based on the grades out there and, and how to tie in the elevation so that it's ADA compliant and has the the right um, slope to it and, and so on. I couldn't tell you, maybe Stacy can, that exact length of that box, but they vary throughout the corridor and they're in that 200-ish foot range. 200 foot, okay. And I guess um, the reason why I ask is I'm just coming from a, a big city perspective. I'm just concerned about personal safety, not just, um, trans, you know, transportation safety is, you know, a concern about, um, that's a great place to get out from the weather. And so sometimes you, you get into those underpasses and it's full of people. So I'll, I'll get out of the way quickly for Stacy to answer this. The one thing okay. I will say that's advantageous about this alignment in the middle, like you have here is you have more space for those slopes to kind of lay back and, and the trail leading into the crossing doesn't have to have quite the substantial walls and things that you might see in other more urbanized areas. So I think that's great as far as like a sunlight and a visual coming in and out of the box culverts because you, if we were more constrained, it was up closer to the roadway or it were a more densely populated area, you'd be looking at walls to come down into a box and then have a distance where you're underground. Um, so that's one benefit, but I'm sure Stacy has. Hey, before you go, Stephen. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and in that area, I mean, this is by 52, is there going to be a weather issue with it being underground there, do you think? Uh, we had talked, uh, Stacy had talked about wetlands, and I just wonder about would there be precipitation or, or standing water in that area? I don't know that there, were, there are any wetlands in this specific area. There okay. are wetlands in the corridor adjacent to some of these crossings that are going to have to be addressed. And in all of these areas, there's going to have to be some kind of drainage mechanism to collect the water and pump it out of these areas. But sorry, Stacey. Yeah, no, you're, you're good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say the other um, safety, personal safety that we're looking at is just lighting. I think is important in these long box, culver box culverts. So we'd be looking at that. And then um, in terms of... Yeah, the dr drainage is just going to be a challenge. It's a low area, a lot of water, so we are going to have to pump the water out. So we'll in, in all all of the underpasses. So we're planning that and designing that. Okay, and I'll just say sometimes even in the short um, underground, I had one in Longmont where a gentleman was spraying the weeds on the other side, and he was you know like kind of standing on the trail and also spraying very close to the trail, and I had to stop and say, um, are you finished, you know, <laughs> saying, <laughs> coming through. Yeah, yeah and if, if you're not paying attention, I mean, it could be a, a pedestrian bicycle accident. So. Yeah. yeah. All right, just a few more, and I should have asked as we were going, like Mr. Langer did. Um, 
So it has to be personal safety. Let's see. Oh, and I think he asked this question. It, there will be some pedestrian traffic as well, you think, in those? Yeah, I mean, we anticipate it'll be more around the bus stations, but the US 36 bikeway has people who run on it and walk on it. I see them yeah. often. I mean, it's not a lot, but there are some people who use it for that purpose. Yeah, we have some people that enjoy long marathons and what have you. Yeah. All right, I think that's all my questions, and thank you for answering all of them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the update. It's been very informative. I'd like to hear more about how signal prioritization for buses will work. So, is it on? So the transit signal priority, the way it is designed, is if the bus uh, is approaching the intersection and you set that check-in period for the bus to be like so many feet from the stop bar, you know, as you're approaching the intersection. Once it's in there, it'll send a signal via a cellular connectivity, if you will, to the traffic signal controller to hold the green phase that is already happening to make sure the bus gets through the intersection. That's really how it works. And that's one of the very effective uh, types, time saving measures that we're implementing on this project. Will it require an action by the bus operator? No. Or is it automated? Automated. Okay. And uh, also, I've noticed that the, the BRT stations are situated such that after a bus has picked up or discharged passengers, the operator has to merge into the leftmost travel lane of the highway. Does the signal prioritization somehow uh, create a gap for the bus to do that? The signal prioritization is really to get the bus through the intersection to get to the far side of the intersection where the uh, station platform and then the parking right is. There is adequate length. The graphics only show, you know, <laughs> sort of what has happened in there, but there is going to be adequate merge for the bus to get up to speed and then merge oh, okay. merge into the. It looks like there's traffic. just a couple bus lengths worth of merge area on this graphic, but it'll be longer. How long that. would it really be? It'll be longer than that because we've the yeah, traffic yeah. study. Yeah, I don't know the exact distance, but we're talking, you know, hundreds or thousands of feet, a thousand right. feet, not what's shown here, which looks to be maybe 150, 200 feet. But again, you know, trying to show the whole graphic and get to a scale where everyone can see it. Right. That, that was kind of the purpose of the red highlighted areas, is just to show both that that length of bypass lane coming into the intersection, and then you go to the station, and then you've got a, an acceleration lane on the other side of the station to help the bus get back up to speed before it merges back over into the lane. And there'll be a distance of that acceleration, then there'll be the you know standard taper and everything like that. So there's gonna be a, a space for the bus to be able to get up to speed and move over. Got it, thank you. Just one last thing on that. On um, I'm curious as to how you're going to maybe do a public education campaign on BRT and, and these sorts of issues because obviously it's going to need to be more of a driver change as opposed to the bus driver change. Yeah, it's a fantastic question. I'll just throw out there, you know, as we move into the public meeting, um, the county's put together a really good video that highlights a lot that's going on with the project and does provide an example of how this will work. Um, there are some things that continue to evolve as we go through design. I think we'll want to use a tool like that, a video. Um, I mean, I will be honest, if you go online and you start searching uh, Q by bypass lanes or bus Q jumps or whatever you might search online, you'll get a whole bunch of materials about the bus being on the outside of the corridor and, and the bus jump being on the outside. You'll get lots of pictures of downtown Denver and so on. This is a very unique application of this. So you're, you're spot on that education will be key. I think you know through the course of this public meeting and from feedback from folks like yourself, we do need to figure out the best way to engage and educate the public on this. Um, I think you know the video is a good start. We'll see how that goes during the, the 
preliminary design meetings and public meetings and as we continue to do outreach hopefully we can hone in how to best explain it because it is a little bit different than what you might see or expect in a in a downtown area but then again we do have a little bit of a different corridor because a lot of the other places you would see this application would be in the middle of a downtown scene so this is a bit of a different context as well just yeah no I, I'm, I'm good yeah just as a, a quick you could do with these when it does get built maybe information kind of sessions at each one of the parking lots when it's first built and, and and if you will try to get a captive audience of motorists to understand kind of like what's going on yeah that's a good suggestion I, I think there's a lot of benefits to this median approach and I think once people get used to it they're gonna really like the way this is set up comparatively to those outside buses um, it is just a piece to get people to understand. It's almost like once you first go there, you're gonna like it, I promise. Let's just figure out how to get you safely to and understand how things work. It's kind of like a roundabout. Yes, ma'am, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great analogy, right? Everyone's like, what is, what's with these crazy roundabouts until Spoken they like realize a... the safety and operational <laughs> benefits. <laughs> Uh, so to piggyback off with what Mr. Lanner said, and actually um, his earlier question, I'm wondering if this would be a good place to have more of a, a concrete barrier rather than striping. Because I'm thinking about on 63rd, um, there's room there for the bus to ramp up, and everybody sees the bus, and yet they never seem to realize that it's going to merge. And I know this isn't going to fully merge, but um, there's just something about a bus gathering speed that causes disruption in the traffic flow yeah and I think there's a lot to evaluate there in terms of the grade right I mean if they're going down a hill it's probably a different scenario than if they're going up a big hill and so on and so forth I think those are things we can look into both with the acceleration lane and kind of the configuration in that area the barrier creates its own potential concerns of safety issues for the the motorist driving and the spacing there and running into the barrier and so on and so forth and so we're gonna have to balance all of that. We're absolutely gonna have barrier at those stations and, and some configuration there to protect um, those those folks that are gonna be waiting to get on the bus. Um, but but what extends out from there and how far, I think we'll contextually we'll have to look at it. Um, what process is done between the people designing and building these roads and say Waze or Google Maps or things like that, is there communication from you to say, we're changing how this is gonna lay out so the instructions need to change? Do you communicate or do they kind of, kind of find out after the fact? So there, we, there's a good, well we have a PI team in, uh, in place with representation from each of the agencies that you see here and they're quite active, but if, um, <laughs> very much so active. So uh, we did the video, uh, thanks to Boulder County and uh, uh, Stacy to spearhead that effort. And uh, the website keeps changing. Um, we will definitely be communicating to the public. We're going to have outreach programs. Christy, if you want to <laughs> add anything to it, or? <laughs> I love that question. I don't know the answer. Yeah, so there will be a lot more coming down the pike. That would be great. I know that when Denver recently did the underpass for 70, it took about two months before Google caught up with it. And I think it would be, especially with that left turn situation we have, we probably would be good to be ahead of that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that information. That's, that's really something that we can look into. True. Do you have any other questions? <laughs> Great. Well, thank yeah. Thank you so much thank again you. for having us here tonight, and thanks for all the questions and great input, really. I mean, it's just uh, we enjoy uh, getting together and talking about these projects, and we are very excited. <laughs> so um, I, I hope you can you can make it to public meeting, and um, looking forward to more coordination and and making things. Uh, happen around here for uh, for you know for the whole region uh, uh, imp improving transportation and all uh, mobility options. So have a good evening. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I think between presentations, we're going to just make sure that your monitors are all set to presentation mode. So.
Jane might help with that. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. So if we're ready, we're going to go ahead with um, Tom Street is going to start the presentation on capital improvement program projects for Longmont fiscal year 22 through 25. Thanks. Chairperson Stewart, board members, my name is Tom Street, as Phil mentioned, and I work within the Public Works and Natural Resources Department. Tonight I'm here with Alden Jenkins and Jace Tefer, and we're here to present some of our transportation-related CIP projects. Wanted to mention a couple things before we get going. One, if you do have questions, feel free to jump in at any time. And two, we group the projects into three different categories. We have one group of projects that uh, is projects that are under construction. We have a group of projects that will be nearing construction in the very short term. And we have a group of projects that are currently under design. Tonight, uh, one of our younger engineers, Jace Terfair, is going to kick off the presentation. Jace has been with the city for just over one year, and uh, he's going to start tonight's presentation talking about our pavement management program. Hi there, Chairperson Stewart, uh, members of TAB. I'm Jace Terfair, as Tom mentioned. Um, I'm going to start out with TRP-001, which is our pavement management program. Uh, this is the most critical annual program the city has um, to maintain and rehabilitate the Longmont's uh, transportation infrastructure. Um, Longmont has roughly 1,200 lane miles of roadway, and this pavement management program allows us to evaluate, maintain, and rehabilitate. Uh, these roadways. Um, this pavement management program has four main activities or programs, uh, concrete rehabilitation, asphalt rehabilitation, chip seal uh, projects, and uh, crack seal projects. Currently, the asphalt rehabilitation and uh, concrete uh, rehabilitation have 10 areas going for this year, 2022. Uh, there, it includes Main Street, 17th Avenue, and Airport Road, just to mention a few roads. And can you click? Do I click? No, you do. Thanks. Um, so if you notice, 
this picture, the picture before was before concrete rehabilitation and asphalt rehabilitation went through. Uh, this is the after picture. Um, this CIP project is estimated to cost, we, it's budgeted at 6.9 million for this year. Moving on to TRP 011, 17th Avenue and Pace Street ADA improvements. ADA stands for Americans with Disability Act. Um, this project was really brought to the city, city's attention by um, uh, a resident filed a formal complaint uh, via the online portal and the city was able to react. And if you notice, I'm gonna go to what this project looks like now. This is the northwest corner. Um, you can see the pedestrian facilities have been upgraded hugely. The, as, as far as truncated domes were added, uh, crosswalks were added, um, and some drainage aspects were added too. You can see all the curb and gutter um, within around each, all four corners. Um, this happened in conjunction with asphalt rehab and concrete rehab earlier this spring. I'm gonna hand it over to Alden to talk about some next projects. Hi, good evening, Chairperson Stewart and board members. My name is Alden Jenkins. I'm a senior civil engineer working with Tom and Jace within Engineering Services. We're gonna go ahead and move on, <clears throat> excuse me, from projects that are under active construction or recently completed to those that are very near to construction. First project that we're gonna be taking a look at here is the Boston Avenue Bridge Replacement Project. Uh, this project will replace the existing bridge structure over the St. Brain River, which you can see in the far distance of the photo there, the sort of blue, blue uh, water feature in the background. Uh, the new bridge will actually be lengthening the bridge span uh, from what is existing. Uh, and at the same time, the creek bed will be lowered. And combined with the new longer bridge span and the lower creek bed, the overall hydraulic capacity of this bridge structure will be increased. Uh, what this does is it'll actually make the structure uh, more capable of conveying the 100 year floodplain. And it's really a continuation of the downstream improvements which you can see in the photo, which were recently completed by the Resilient St. Brain project. So beyond just improvements to the floodplain, the replacement of this bridge structure has a multimodal component to it in that it will be improving the um, pedestrian and bike access across the bridge, which right now doesn't meet our preferred standards for a collector roadway. Uh, this project, uh, I think, was mentioned by Jim a little earlier tonight. Plan to go to construction, uh, or sorry, bid uh, this month still, and ideally construction would be happening in August or September of this year. Right now, we have an esti uh, estimate estimated construction cost of around eight million dollars uh, for this project. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. So. It's a very good question. Uh, question being, where is the detour traffic going to be going uh, when this is under construction? Uh, that was actually partially uh, why this project was part of the third uh, open house that Jim um, Angstad had mentioned earlier, because uh, while this bridge, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, is not going to be closed fully, traffic will still be maintained. Traffic will still be maintained. Uh, people may. Uh, learn to and want to take different routes. Uh, we're not going to be promoting different routes necessarily during construction, but Third Avenue uh, through the Old Town area may be used by motorists to avoid bridge construction. Even though we're not going to be promoting it or closing it, it may be used for that. <laughs> we are not. Yes. All right, so moving on to another project that is very near to construction is our Third Avenue Multimodal Improvements Project. This project is uh, not only a multimodal improvement project, it's also a preventative maintenance project. Uh, in terms of multimodal improvements, uh, primarily include striping changes along Third Avenue from Martin Street to Ken Pratt Boulevard or State Highway 119. Uh, the existing, existing conditions that you see here right now in the photo is uh, at and to just the east of the Lashley Street intersection. 
our proposed striping changes at the same location include the addition of on-street buffered bike lanes. And that's for the entire length of the project from Martin Street to Ken Pratt Boulevard. We're gonna be accomplishing that without eliminating any travel lanes or turn lanes. It's gonna be strictly the uh, reducing the width of the existing turn lanes and travel lanes, which are wider than they need to be. Uh, project will also plan to install green pavement markings as you see as well. Uh, those are intended to be installed at conflict, potential conflict areas for bikes and vehicles. Uh, really the intent there is to provide a greater visibility of the bike lane facility and those that are using it as they pass through those conflict areas. I mentioned this is also a preventative maintenance project. Uh, that is because it is gonna be getting completed alongside, sorry, the striping changes are getting completed alongside a chip seal resurfacing project uh, that will happen simultaneously. Design for the striping is uh, just about complete right now and we are hoping to go to construction for this project in mid-summer of this year. So, Thank you. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, looking at that corner going uh, third to Lashley, um, this, I, I, one reason you're going to be able to narrow the lanes is they are too wide because it was originally a much faster road. And That's I right. noticed that most people don't come down to the new speed limit. And so I'm wondering what plans there are for signing and helping the drivers really learn, other than stopping them and giving them tickets, really learn that that's a much lower road. Mm -hmm. Will the narrowing be part of that? And what other plans do you have for signage or encouraging people to slow down? So to kind of two-part question uh, to that, in terms of getting traffic to slow down, part of the design is to narrow the travel lanes. And that lane narrowing inherently has the effect of slowing traffic down some. Um, just posting a speed limit doesn't necessarily mean that people are gonna follow it. Uh, so by, go, by designing it for traffic to travel slower, uh, the intent is that they will then follow that lower speed limit. I think currently it's posted at 45 miles per hour right. all the way to Ken Pratt Boulevard. Uh, in terms of getting people used to the new facility itself, there's gonna be quite a bit of signage that gets installed for yielding to bikes uh, at some of the merge locations. Uh, it's adding a new facility on street where there is no bike facility. Uh, and so there will be that learning curve with vehicles and we're gonna be using signage to support that and educate up and down the quarter. Beyond that, uh, this project does not have any plans to install any sort of speed limits uh, signs. I think there's one existing for westbound right now. Uh, so in terms of those two questions, that's... Thank you. So, okay, any other questions yeah. for this project? Yeah, thank you. So I witnessed today going down Lashley, it's kind of a complicated place for bicycles to travel. And I witnessed um, uh, people in the right lane traveling into the left lane to avoid uh, bicyclists. And I'm just wondering, I noticed you've got um, some dark striping here and you know, the green merging. I'm just wondering if the lanes are are tighter, if you think there might be some traveling then between lanes when they see a bicycle lane next to them. Um, would you mind clarifying your question so I can understand a little bit better? Okay, so the lanes on third are, are wide at this time That's and correct. you're going to make them more narrow to accommodate a bike lane. But I'm wondering if, um, because the lane is more narrow, if that might cause motorists to actually travel into the left lane to, you know, to kind of accommodate bicyclists. There, there is this, um, I think it's a psychological factor. I know there's room for it. But I witnessed this on Lashley, just um, driving on Lashley today and said, hmm, okay. Sure, okay. So just sort of wandering into the adjacent lane mm -hmm. to, yeah, to, to move to, away to from the To give a cyclist, bicyclist, yeah, right. a wide berth is, sure. Is, yeah. Uh, with the narrower lanes, it certainly does provide less maneuverability uh, for that vehicle. But these buffers are, uh, sorry, the bike lanes are five feet uh, minimum, and the buffer itself is two feet. Uh, that has been our standard so far for buffered bike lanes that we've been installing. 
There's mm -hmm. uh, various locations throughout town, uh, Pike Road, west of Main Street, and then also on Pace Street, north of 17th Avenue. Uh, I can't speak from ex my own experience, but generally I, we, we found that to be adequate in terms of providing that uh, safe buffer for a vehicle not to want to wander into the, the adjacent lane. Uh, there will be sections of 3rd Avenue where the buffer is larger, uh, specifically east of Lashley or east of Alpine. The buffer, I believe, uh, expands to three feet, and the bike lane itself is actually going to be larger than five feet as well. So there should be more than enough room for the bike to comfortably move or be cycling on the shoulder edge and then for a vehicle to pass it without feeling uncomfortable being too close to the cyclist. And do you think some of this is the responsibility of the bicyclists? I notice sometimes they tend to be closer to the striping than, than to the side of the road, and I, I'm not sure why that happens. And so then it kind of crowds the motorist. And uh, this is all, it's all striping. There's no barrier there, That's correct? Cor That's correct. Yeah. There is no vertical barrier between the, the bike and the, okay. cy the cyclist or the bike lane. Sometimes yeah. that can happen because there's debris in the bike lane, mm -hmm. and a lot of that debris gets pushed there and by the, by the vehicles or by whatever. So uh, there's a lot of reasons why bikes will move outside of the, the bicycle lane, and so, or people riding bikes are moving outside the bicycle lane. So this does provide that extra, as Alton mentioned, two feet at least buffer, and some of it is taken away from the lane, but the lanes are still um, very wide as compared to a car. So um, typically we like, I think they're even wider here than our typical 12 foot. Uh, no, we're not going. 12? Yeah, we're not going greater than 12 feet. And actually, at Third Avenue in particular, or sorry, Lashley in particular, uh, I believe we're 11 feet. Uh, for comparison, the travel lanes through downtown, uh, north of Third Avenue, on 287, are, uh, I believe, 10 feet in a lot of areas. There might even be some nine and a half in some areas. And so these are going to be 11 feet at the minimum. Uh, in some locations, they'll be up at 12. So in this example that I'm using today, I was I was behind the motorist and, and the bicyclist, so I was, I was observing this, and I think some of it is just the nature of bicycling. I think the gentleman on the bicycle was just enjoying his ride and wasn't aware that he was, you know, traveling into the, the lane to where the motorist was uncomfortable. And so I'm just wondering, is there something we can do to um, make sure that those lanes are clean and that bicyclists know that maybe they should, you know, try to give that lane in that line a little room um, so that they're not affecting motorists or you know or motorists are like you know aware of bicyclists which is a good good thing but also then not always you know they're watching the bicyclists and they're not always watching what's going on in the left lane it's just an idea sure uh, and I, I don't have a, an answer to is there you know an education piece to cyclists to make sure that they're going to be um, staying closer to the center of the facility they're using or not. Uh, in terms of maintenance, it's a matter of just making sure that any sort of street sweeping, uh, snow removal, things of that nature, are aware that that facility exists uh, and that it's the intent is to keep it clear. Okay. Are you doing any community engagement in, the, in regards to these projects? We have. Uh, we've provided, uh, before design started, uh, we had provided an indication that we were gonna, going to be installing this new facility on 3rd Avenue. Um, we have gone to our Bicycle Issues Committee to get their feedback and thoughts on uh, this particular project and any sort of design modifications that the cycling community would like to see. Uh, to my knowledge, beyond uh, the Bicycle Issues Committee, there has not been uh, a lot of feedback from the general public on this. Um, there are no houses that are ge directly adjacent to it. We're not removing parking in any locations because there's no parking that exists. So. By and large, uh, there's not been a lot of feedback. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. And I can just add on just a little bit that we do have a traffic safety coordinator as part of transportation planning group, so we can pass on your concerns about education and, and f making sure bicyclists understand how to use the lanes correctly. So we'll, we'll move that into our group a little bit of, about how we try to educate folks on that. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, I feel pretty strongly about this. So there's a three-foot rule that's by law. A car has to give a cyclist three feet. doesn't matter how wide the lane is. And if they can't pass safely, they don't pass. That's a law. 
So it's not the motorist response, it's not the cyclist responsibility. The motorist actually has a responsibility to do no harm. Mm -hmm. A cyclist is a vulnerable user on this, this road. And so you're doing a typical road diet, from what I can tell. And is this just a section to, because are there other, are there other examples of road diets that you've done in Longmont? And we'll say what the success rate was in terms of pushback from the driving public versus the users of, of the space? We have done a, a couple of road diets uh, within the Longmont. Probably one of the first ones was on Sunset Street from Pike Road north to Kansas Avenue. I think that was completed in possibly 2019. Um, it was actually the photo that was provided in our pavement management program, uh, slide by Jace, was that project. Uh, I don't personally have the uh, w I, w I wasn't personally getting any responses uh, for that uh, after that was installed. However, I did hear uh, through one of our prior uh, engineering administrators that there was some pushback from the traveling public when that was installed. But I think the proof is in usage now in that uh, even though we did take lanes away and installed bike lanes, it did not have a detrimental effect on traffic flows within that corridor. Uh, the same can be said for a more recent project, Ninth Avenue, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. uh, Francis to Bowen. We mm -hmm. actually took two lanes each direction and changed that to a three-lane section with bike lanes on either side. Mm -hmm. uh, that, from my experience, uh, had the same type of feedback where the initial response was negative with some uh, traveling public. Uh, but, uh, again, I think the proof is in that it still functions adequately and well uh, from a vehicle perspective. Is there any thought about, besides Sharrow's, which my personal opinion is Sharrow's don't do anything because it's just paint. So rumble strips, uh, even the little turtles that they use in Europe, to anything else that's not uh, something that would cause a car, obviously, to, to run over and, and you know, possibly kind of, I don't want to say hurt the car, but, you know, cause an accident um, beyond, you know, what would normally be used. Beyond just the buffered striping? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Currently, we don't uh, have anything planned for that uh, along those lines. Part of the challenge is any, anything that's going to be beyond striping is going to be uh, an issue for snow removal and maintenance. Right. <clears throat> um, we did run a pilot project for separated bike lanes, uh, protected bike lanes on Pike Road uh, a few years ago to evaluate the reception from the cycling community. Uh, as well as our own operations department's ability to maintain that facility. And the, the conclusion from that pilot project was that buffered bike lanes was going to yield the most comfortable experience for the cyclist and the best uh, maintenance record for uh, keeping them clear of snow and, and, and debris. So at this time now, uh, just the striping is, is what we've, we're opting for with this project. But... That doesn't mean that we may reevaluate in the future, future if it makes sense, but for now, we're not. Great. Thank you. No, I appreciate the input on that. You're welcome. Any other questions about Third Avenue? Great. All right, so moving on to our Boston Avenue Connection Phase 2 project. Uh, what a... What I'd like to do is just a quick reminder of what our phase one is. Some of you may be wondering, what is phase one of Boston Avenue connection? And so what that is, or what it was, uh, was a connection that was completed in 2016 that made a new connection of Boston Avenue between Main Street and Martin Street. This phase two connection uh, is actually going to be west of South Pratt Parkway uh, and Price Road. And it is a long planned project to create a new at-grade crossing to make that connection of Boston Avenue across the railroad tracks to uh, Price Road. You can see with this new connection that just showed up in red here, uh, it is critical to the city's overall transportation network uh, in that it will provide a new uninterrupted east-west connection along Boston Avenue from Airport Road all the way to Martin Street. Uh, at the same time, it's going to act as the primary uh, access route for, if I remember right, it's the blue line, uh, for bus rapid transit, which you heard quite a bit about this evening from our friends at RTD. Uh, 
so this connection would be used as for the Blue Route connection to make its way over uh, from the Kaufman Street Busway project, which you'll hear about in a second, over to Hover. This particular project, uh, because it is going to have a connection across the railroad, requires approval from the Public Utilities Commission, or PUC. That's the next critical step in securing this connection, and our plan is to submit that application to the PUC in mid-summer of this year. We're hopeful to start construction in 2023, however, and that comes with a large however, uh, with application to the PUC uh, that could, uh, depending on the circumstances of how that application goes, uh, could extend our ability to start construction uh, or delay construction and, and the likely scenario is that we won't be able to start until 2024, more than likely. Uh, this project is currently estimated at a $3.3 million construction budget. So as I mentioned, uh, our next project here is our Kaufman Street Busway project, with some, which some of you have heard of. I believe we took this project to the Transportation Advisory Board uh, in 2021 to evaluate different types of alternatives uh, uh, and uh, what the recommendation would be from the, from the board. This multimodal transportation project goes through the heart of downtown along Kaufman Street from 1st Avenue to 9th Avenue. It is a true multi multimodal project in that it has a variety of improvements, uh, first of which is the inclusion of dedica dedicated bus lanes in some areas. Um, these bus lanes will serve as the primary access routes for the bus rapid transit system that will be coming to Longmont. Beyond that, it also includes separated bike lanes uh, that are not on street. They're fully separated and a separate grade from the roadway itself uh, for both north northbound and southbound Kaufman Street for the length of the project. It also includes pedestrian improvements in the form of wider sidewalks, various mid-block crossings, uh, as well as uh, um, intersection improvements at all the intersections up and down the corridor. Uh, this project is well under design with completion expected in early 2023. Uh, we've had extensive stage, stakeholder engagement thus far with the general public at large, uh, property owners, business owners, tenants that work and live along the corridor of Kaufman Street, uh, as well as uh, external stakeholders at CDOT, BNSF, and RTD. And there is federal and state grant funding included with this project of about $6.9 million. 6.15 of which is slated for construction. Our total estimated construction cost right now, uh, and I guess I'll say the caveat of in today's dollars, is $13.5 million. Uh, this was previously scheduled to start in 2023. We are looking at, or targeting now a 2024 start date to better align the opening day of this project, the Kaufman Street Busway, with the opening day of the first and main transit station which is a key component of the BRT system uh, for the entire Longmont cor or corridor and Longmont in particular. So any questions about this project? Okay, with that, I think I will be passing it off to Chase. Thank you. Thanks, Alden. Uh, moving on to the Next project, TRP 105 is 17th Avenue sidewalk improvement projects. So if you'll notice, the red is the limits of our project. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever walked on the north side of 17th Avenue, but the sidewalks are in very poor condition. So the goal of this project, we're going to go through and um, remove the asphalt sidewalk you can see and replace it with a concrete sidewalk um, that will meet all current standards. Um, our design is 100% complete, but we have some caveats, not with the design, but we're working on uh, land acquisitions right now and right away. We actually have had 12 of 19 go through city council and be approved, and we're hoping the other um, the other land acquisitions and right away uh, make it through this next month. So that, that'll be pretty good. Um, 
the fourth quarter of this year, we want to advertise for construction, and then we're hoping to um, go into construction uh, spring of next year. Um, this current this project is currently estimated at seven hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. The next project I would like to talk about uh, is DRN zero two eight uh, Spring Gulch number two phase three. So if you'll notice. There's a red dotted line that is going to be the um, north to south greenway connection. Um, and when I'm saying north to south, that this is actually a really big deal for Longmont. This is going to connect uh, Ute Creek Golf Course to the Sandstone Ranch um, nature area. So this is a huge improvement for Longmont. Um, this phase three includes a pedestrian underpass underneath the Great Great Western Railroad. Um, our design is currently at 90%. Uh, construction slated for 2023. And we are estimating the CIP project is going to cost around $3 million. So now I'm going to hand it off to Tom if you don't have any questions. Our Ken Pratt Boulevard and Sunset Street project has two primary objectives. We have intersection improvements and we have a road diet associated with it. The so-called road diet will change the existing section on Sunset Street. Alden talked about it just a little bit earlier. Currently we have four lanes. We have two through lanes in each direction. And with the road diet, we'll change the striping. We'll have one through lane each direction, a center left turn lane, and on-street bike lanes in each direction. And this section of the road diet will extend from Kansas Avenue north to Nelson Road. As far as the intersection improvements, we're going to be widening Sunset Street at Ken Pratt Boulevard. The widening will accommodate one through lane for each direction of Sunset Street, but we'll now have dedicated left turns and right turns for both directions in addition to on-street bike lanes. The project also includes some improvements at the railroad crossing, and these improvements will facilitate a future quiet zone at this location. Design is approximately 30% complete. We did, uh, we did uh, get a grant for this project, uh, a safer Main Street grant in the amount of $1.2 million, and that's for the construction phase. Currently, we're estimating the uh, construction cost of this project to be $3.7 million, and we believe this project will be ready for construction during the spring of 2024. Our next project is our Dry Creek Greenway Connection Project. This project will design and construct an 8-foot wide concrete multi-use path along Dry Creek, it'll connect into the existing trail along the eastern portion of the village at the Peaks Mall. It'll head east and tie into Sunset Street. Uh, looking at the slide uh, to the right, it shows the conceptual alignment of the new concrete path adjacent to Dry Creek, in addition to some planned on-street bike lanes for Court Parkway. This project is almost at a 30% design level. We're estimating construction will cost about $900,000 for this project. And again, it's another project that we think will be ready for construction in the spring of 2024. These two projects uh, are very similar. They're both on County Line Road. One is on the south end of County Line Road, the other is on the north end of County Line Road, and both of these projects will bring multimodal improvements to this busy transportation corridor. The segment uh, to the south from Zlayton Drive to the St. Vrain River is a project that is currently under design. It's a joint project with Boulder County. Currently, we're splitting design costs with the county. We expect a city share to cost around $80,000. And the design is approximately 50% complete at this point. We're estimating the construction for this project to cost about $700,000.
and the scope will include widening of County Line Road to facilitate on-street bike lanes in each direction. The project will also include various drainage improvements and an asphalt overlay. Uh, we've been discussing potential cost-sharing arrangements with Boulder County, but at this point we haven't actually started working on any type of, of agreement. Uh, as far as the segment to the north, from 17th Avenue to State Highway 66, another, another project that will bring multimodal improvements to this section of County Line Road. Uh, the scope will include widening of County Line Road to facilitate on-street bike lanes in each direction. This project also includes an asphalt overlay and striping improvements. The city did uh, acquire an outside grant for the design phase of this project. Uh, we have funding coming in through Dr. Cog in the amount of 225000 That funding requires a local match by the city. That local match is 225000 so that sets our total design budget at 450000 Currently, we have staff working on the selection process to acquire a consultant to work on this project. Um, I did want to mention that uh, one of our big goals as we're moving through the design process for this project is to um, really look for outside funding options to do the construction of these improvements. So we're going to be looking at various grants and also we're going to have conversations with some of the key area stakeholders, Weld County and Bold County, Boulder County as far as potential funding partnerships for the construction phase of this project. Quick question. Sure. On the TRP um, 011, the 17th Avenue to SH66, how did you get that picture with the gentleman walking on the side of the road? <laughs> That's perfect. It, 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 it actually is. You didn't Photoshop that. Yeah. I didn't yeah. Photoshop that. It's a real life picture. <laughs> we, 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 spent, uh, we spent about a year and a half constructing County Line Road just south of here, and I happened to be out there on that particular day taking pictures to the south, and then when I saw that, I couldn't resist trying to, trying to, trying to take that picture at that moment in time, but yeah, great picture. And, and it's obvious from both, both photographs that there's definitive needs along this corridor. It's just lots of improvements are needed. One thing I'll just add is that we came to you previously at a previous TAB meeting and talked to you about possible what we call TIP projects, transportation improvement program projects through Dr. Coggin. So this was one of them, and we just wanted to put that out. Uh, Tom's talking about the design piece of this. Uh, we're hoping to get uh, awarded the next stage of funds to do the construction of what gets designed. Thanks. The uh, you mentioned, did you mention Weld County? Is there any... Uh, plan to have cost sharing with them? Are they involved with any of this? They certainly will be. They'll be involved in the review of the project. Um, we actually had conversations with Weld County last week, as a matter of fact, and there were some high level conversations about potential cost sharing options during the construction phase of the project. But we'll, we'll definitely be talking to Boulder County and Weld County both. Thank you. Well, this is our final slide of the night. Uh, this shows most of the transportation-related CIP projects that we have in progress. And uh, really, at this time, we just wanted to open up and see what type of final comments and questions you may have. We just looked at a photo of a gentleman walking right on the edge of the travel lane. Does, does that improvement include sidewalks as well as bike lanes? Not with this phase of the project, no. So next time we see it, he'll be walking in the bike lane? Well, it'll be a much safer condition than we have today, but uh, the, to, to be upfront and transparent, there are no pedestrian facilities, dedicated pedestrian facilities uh, being planned with this project at this point. Thank you. And then going back to your very first project, when you design ADA ramps for an intersection, do you study the potential for water to collect and ice to build up at the low point of the ramps? It's one of the primary focus. We've had so many problems over the last five or 10 years, either with maintenance or poor drainage, 
that it's certainly a focus for us. Great. Uh, based on my personal experience, I'd urge you to redouble your efforts in that regard. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to thank you guys for the time and the effort you put into this because this is very comprehensive and it is good to see that Dr. Cog, for example, on the, um, the last two slides that we saw that we're moving ahead with that. And I know you had mentioned, Phil, um, prior or during the last discussion, is a city facility going to be put in there, a park or something on the uh, west side? Currently, the city is the full owner of all the property along the west side of County Line Road from State Highway 66 coming down to 17th Avenue. The way I understand it, there are two future uses. We have some open space, and that will remain as open space, but right at the corner with State Highway 66, there is a future park being planned for that location. Last I heard, it, it's not imminent. It's not in the next five years, but it might be in the next five to 10 years. So that might, faci that might facilitate then us being able to move towards pedestrian facilities. It'll definitely drive that need. Okay. Thank yeah, you. With the development much. of the park, we will add um, what's called side paths along that uh, section of State of County Line Road and State Highway 66, quite frankly. I should also mention that it's going to be a buffered bikeway, so it will have the extra two feet to help bicycles get around pedestrians, possibly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to oh. say thank you, Mr. Street and uh, Mr. Jenkins and um, and Mr. Tur Turfer, <laughs> Jace. I, thank you for fielding all our questions. It was really very comprehensive. And as you can tell, we're very concerned about bicycle safety on our, our board. So I appreciate your consideration in that regard. Thanks for your time and interest. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks to the other members of the board. I, I thought um, um, Ms. Michelle and Ms. Osborne, I mean, great ideas, you know, things we hadn't thought about, uh, like with Google and, and, um, and Mr. Lehner also. Thanks for being in the trenches with me and bicycle lane safety, and especially Mr. McInerney uh, for signal prior prioritization. Um, it was a question I had that I missed, so I was glad that you asked it. Um, anyway, uh, great presentations to all that presented today, and appreciate all of you. Thanks so much for coming. That's my cue. Uh, thanks for your presentation. It was very informative, and uh, no further questions or comments at this time. It's red. Thank you. Again, thank you very much for, for all the time and the effort you put into this. Yes, thank you for the detailed information. And in general, I just would like to say I've learned a lot being on the transportation board. It's my final meeting um, along with Sandra. So I uh, had a great opportunity to serve in the public capacity and learn about policy. And it's been a, a great experience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone. It has been, I, I love the pictures. I love the effort you took to make these very, everyone took to make very visual explanations. It really helped us to think 
or helped, I should not speak for others, helped me to think of the things that I wouldn't have thought without those pictures. So that was a very good presentation. And I wanted to, to thank Chairperson Stewart and Board Member Michelle for being patient during the time that I was learning how to do this and the great example and the work you've done. Thank you. Yes, I don't get the last word. Okay, I get the last word. Here we go. Thank goodness it's the last word. Um, I'd like to thank Phil and Ben and Caroline and Jane and Stacy and all of you that were here tonight um, and all the engineers and planners and supportive staff in the department for your continued excellent work, specifically during all the challenges that COVID-19 has brought to bear. I believe you all are working extra hard due to staff openings, and I have great confidence in the staff that with your knowledge, your experience, and your thoughtfulness, the details will continue. I appreciate that the staff works so well with our transportation partners throughout the county, the region, state, and federal to secure much needed funding from uh, the major projects that are currently being constructed as well as making future funding for projects. May I say that I'm encouraged as I see a continued emphasis on all the projects addressing multimodal choices. Really appreciate that. And I know that you all will continue to put safety first as a priority. Thank you for your dedication to this most important work. Thank you. Okay. We have one more item? Oh, gosh. All right. No, okay. The item, are, we don't have a council person here this evening, but the item for upcoming agenda? No, we have an item, I think. Uh, oh. Oh, Phil. Oh, Phil. Oh, well, gosh. Well, Sorry, can, we Phil. We can go okay. through the agenda you... items, too, for next, next month that you will not be present for. But yes, in I'm... saying that, we wanted to also thank you and show our appreciation for you and Courtney's uh, perseverance through all this. I mean, it, is, it has been tough and it's been very interesting, but you've stuck with it and we appreciate your time on the board. So with that, we have a couple certificates we'd like to present to you. Um, Sandy, you didn't get to sa sign your own um, <laughs> certificate because <laughs> it didn't seem right. So anyway, we want to give you uh, certificates to just acknowledge that. And we do have some little snacks up in the at the top for uh, once we're off camera and you, you can... Uh, <laughs> Have, have a little bit of social time back there to say goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay. I have the ability to adjourn this meeting. So we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Phil.